Well, good morning. Hey, before we jump into things, wanted to just say something about that preaching summit, a little extra on that. Man, it's so exciting. Next Sunday evening, we got eight guys who are going to be preaching, um, and many of them, it's their first time ever giving this a try. So if you'd like to come out for that, doors are going to open at five, and you're, you're, you're more than welcome to just come for one person, two people, all of the whole thing. But I want to give you a heads up. We will close the doors when, when each person gets up to preach. We don't want to cause a bunch of distractions for them. So again, and check out the schedule, come when you want, but we'll, we'll close the doors while they're preaching, open them back up for a little bit, and it's going to be a great evening. I also wanted to thank you so much for uh, kind of putting up with some of the parking issues. If you got to look out there, we've had a lot of construction going on this week, and so I know it's a little bit inconvenient, but I really don't want to apologize too much because it's a great reason we're having to do this. Uh, we had four baptisms last week, three today, at least three that I know of today, and uh, God, God is really doing a, th a thing here. He's really moving, and we're excited to see where he's taking us. And this building is just going to be a tool to use to reach more and more people for Christ. But we hope to eliminate some parking issues next week because our middle school ministry has agreed to valet park next week. So that should <laughs> help some things out. They are more than willing, more than willing. So... Well, as Jeff said, we're in the sixth week of this series called Weeds in My Garden. It's a series about being honest about mental health. And I hope that this series has been helpful to, in, in, in many ways, but to kind of destigmatize mental health issues for us so that we can really be honest with one another about what's going on in our lives and in our minds. And I also hope that this series has provoked us to be better equipped to carry one another's burdens. So before we started this series, we did this like internal anonymous survey. And in this survey, one of the questions we asked was, in the past 12 months, have you struggled with any of these issues? And then we listed worry and anxiety, burnout and stress, depression, self-esteem issues, self-harm uh, self and suicide, and trauma. A few weeks ago, we talked about anxiety and worry. And 77% uh, of those who responded to the survey said this was an issue for them in the past 12 months. It was our highest, uh, the highest kind of issue. But the second highest came in at 64%. And that's what we're talking about today, that of stress and burnout. According to research from Barna Group, in 2015, 72% of pastors said they felt very satisfied with their jobs as pastors. But in 2022, that number was down to 52%, from 72 to 52%, who said they were very satisfied with their jobs. The CEO of Barna said that a drop in the level of pastoral health this significant in just seven years isn't just unprecedented. It signals a crisis that the church has to address. Their research went on to say that an astonishing 40% of pastors now show a high risk of burnout. That's an almost 400% increase since 2015 when that number was just 11%. In 2022, over 40% of pastors consistently answered yes when asked if they were seriously considering throwing in the towel, quitting. Among those pastors who were considering quitting, burnout risk skyrockets to 69%. So I'm not reading these statistics so you'll feel sorry for me. I'm reading these because... If pastors, who should have a pretty decent relationship with Jesus, if they're struggling with stress and burnout at an alarming rate, what's it like for the rest of the church? So I imagine that everyone in here who's listening is probably dealing with some sort of stress right now because it, it comes from literally every area of our life. You might be under pressure, facing big changes, feeling a lack of a control, shouldering heavy responsibility or feeling uncertain about the future. It might be, you might be facing stressful situations because you're facing multiple issues at once. You might be feeling the effect of past experiences on present ones, having a lack of resources or support in your life. It might be triggered by illness, injury, parenting, infertility, bereavement, abuse, marriage, divorce, relationships, caregiving. You might have lost your job be unemployed long-term, retiring, feeling the pressure of deadlines, exams, work, strife, unreasonable expectations, or a new job. You might be moving, 
dealing with difficult neighbors, worrying about money or drowning in debt. Did I find it? Did one of those resonate with you? Some of you are like, no, about 12 of them, Steve, right? Now my blood pressure is through the roof. Look, stress is not abnormal. And, and we shouldn't expect that we can avoid it all because it's, it's, it's a part of life. The issue is whether or not we are managing stress in a healthy way. Because if we aren't, it can lead to something that is far more debilitating, something we call burnout. Now, I know we use that term generically because, uh, you know, where, we live, where we're at in our culture, but there is such a thing as clinical burnout. So let me show you the difference between stress and burnout. So stress is over-engagement. And you know what this is. You, you commit to too many things, and you just don't have the time and energy to manage them all. But burnout is disengagement. With stress, you have overactive emotions. You get too passionate or really strong emotions when you're under stress. But with burnout, when you're in burnout, your emotions get blunted. You might even describe yourself as just being numb. Under stress, there's urgency or hyperactivity. Like you're, you're totally on all the time during stress. But in burnout, it's, it's like just the opposite. There's this feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. Under stress, there could be a loss of energy, but under burnout, there's a loss of motivation. Under stress, you might be dealing with anxiety, but with burnout, you get detached and start to feel depressed. Under stress, you can have physical damage to yourself. You know, heart attacks, strokes, things like that can happen with too much stress in your life. But in burnout, you can have emotional damage, not just physical damage. Stress can be life-threatening, but with burnout, Life doesn't feel worth living anymore. Some of us, even in our positive moments of life, we can be so driven by our purpose and passion that we allow massive amounts of stress into our lives. Like, this is me. I find great purpose. I have great passion in what I get to do. But if we're not coming from a, a position of well-being, we can spin out and we can end up in a ditch. Some of you, you looked over this list and, and you were like, wow, <laughs> check, 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 right? And some of you who have middle school and high school students, you're like, check, 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 right? It's a lot. It's a lot. So before we get too far into this message, I just, I want to give you a little bit of hope. Just because this may be an issue in your life, that does not mean you are done just because you're burned out. Because God can help you. He can use the negative space in your life right now and transform it into part of your testimony. So what is, what is burnout? Here's kind of the clinical definition. Burnout is a debilitating condition that erodes energy, optimism, and effectiveness. And it really develops in six stages. And it kind of begins with one, and then when you get to the sixth stage, you're really in clinical burnout. So here's how it develops. Stage one is emotional exhaustion. Anybody feeling that? If that's you, you need to consider this a warning sign that you are moving closer and closer, closer to burnout. Stage two is increased frequency and duration of negative assessment. Uh, this has to do with how you view yourself. So you view yourself in a negative light. And if there are more and more times that you're feeling this way and it's lasting longer and longer, this is another sign that you are moving in the direction of burnout. Stage three is loss of emotional stability personal discipline, and resiliency. So what do I mean by that? So loss of emotional stability means that you begin to lose your filters and you start riding the roller coaster of emotions. Um, loss of personal discipline, you might let yourself go, you might disconnect from things that were normally rules in your life. And resiliency, it's like you just don't bounce back like you used to bounce back. Stage four is isolation, and things are really getting very dangerous in this stage where we think that nobody understands what I'm dealing with. I don't see any way out of this, and no one can help me. You're isolated. Stage five, you have diminished work effectiveness, so you can't, just can't do what you used to be able to do as well as you used to be able to do it, and it's because of these other four stages that are at play in burnout. And then stage six, this is where you're clinically burned out, it's identity, impairment, and confusion. You no longer understand who and whose you are. And you're confused about it. Now, that's stuff that came from medical professionals. And, and it's very helpful. But I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a therapist. 
And I'm certainly not the smartest guy out there, not even the sm smartest guy on the stage. There's probably someone hidden here. So, right? But I can point you to one who is way, way smarter than any, anyone out there, than the smartest per person out there. And there are plenty of examples in God's word of people that were working themselves through burnout. One example that I want us to examine today is one I think that can help us to spot those signs and how to manage that stress in our lives so we don't end up in a place called burnout. And if we, if we do, if we do end up in that place, hopefully it helps us to recognize the way in which God is providing out for us. So we're going to look at the story of an Old Testament prophet named Elijah. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17. You can open to 1 Kings 17. Now, God kind of calls Elijah out of nowhere, meaning we don't really have any backstory on Elijah. The first mention of Elijah is found in 1 Kings 17, 1, and it says this, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. So his story opens with Elijah delivering a message from God to a very evil king over Israel at that time. The king's name is Ahab. Ahab was married to a very evil woman, more evil than he was. Her name was Jezebel. And you probably don't know anyone who has named their son Ahab. You probably don't know anyone who has named their daughter Jezebel. And the reason is, well, it's probably the same reason you don't know anyone who has named their kid Adolf. Right? Like these names are associated with evil. Ahab and Jezebel did incredibly evil things. So Elijah has to deliver this message from God to Ahab. And this message was not good news. Because of the rebellion and idolatry and godlessness of the people of Israel and their king, Ahab, God was sending discipline in the form of a drought on the land for years. Now the goal the goal always of discipline is to bring people back to repentance. But what this means is because of this drought, there was going to be a famine in the land. And obviously, this would bring a whole lot of stress to the people of Israel. But this message also brought a lot of stress on Elijah. This, this would not have been a fun message to have to deliver to a very powerful, very evil, and very volatile king, King Ahab. You've heard the phrase, don't shoot the messenger. Well, this messenger, Elijah, lived every day of his life in fear because he obeyed the Lord and he communicated this kind of bad news to the king. In fact, the very next verse says in 1 Kings 17, 2, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide. Hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. So think about the stress Elijah was enduring, living in hiding and fearing for his life every day. Elijah had to leave his homeland and go to a place that he wasn't used to, stress. He had to totally depend on God. As a matter of fact, God had him sit at a brook and God provided ravens to supply him with food each day, which was a miraculous gift from God that would sustain Elijah through the famine, but it was also it had, to have some, it had to have some uncertainty in that and stress. But eventually, this brook ran dry because of the drought, more stress. So Elijah had to be on the move again. And so God leads him to the home of a Gentile widow in a foreign land. More stress. This widow and her son, they have no food left. More stress. Again, he has to rely on God. Now God continues to provide for him, but in the midst of the goodness of God providing for him, this widow's son actually grows ill and dies. And this widow comes to Elijah in despair, not knowing what she's going to do. And Elijah is bearing the weight of this emotional turmoil here. More stress. So God calls Elijah to raise the boy back to life. Again, God provides with an incredible miracle. But again, think of this, the stress of just day-to-day -day life living during a famine. And on top of that, King Ahab had his people going all throughout the land in different lands to try and find and hunt and kill Elijah. In fact, we read in 1 Kings 18.10 that King, King Ahab's palace administrator, a man named Obadiah, who was a believer and kind of like a, a secret agent for good, Obadiah met with Elijah uh, about three years into this famine. And he said this to Elijah. He said, As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master, where, where Ahab, has not sent someone to look for you. 
so they can have you killed. Every single day, for a solid three years, Elijah dealt with that stress. But after three years of drought and famine, God tells Elijah to present himself before Ahab. Like, you know, this king who's trying to have him killed. That's not stressful, right? Elijah does obey, and he sends word to Ahab to meet him on a place called Mount Carmel. And Elijah basically challenges Ahab to a duel of the gods, to a duel of the gods. So here's what Elijah said in 1 Kings 18, 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So these prophets of Baal and prophets of Asherah, Baal and Asherah were pagan uh, gods, not real gods, pagan gods, false gods that, uh, that they worshiped. It says, so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver between two gods, Baal and the one true God? If the Lord is God, follow him. If, but if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And then this is how the duel was going to go down. So the prophets of this false god, Baal, they were to build an altar to their god, to, god, to Baal. And then Elijah was going to build an altar to his god, our god, the one true god. And they would cut up pieces of, of bull and put the, the pieces of the animal on the wood on the altar, but they would not set it on fire. And Elijah said this in verse 24. He said to them, Then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, What you say is good. They're like, We agree to this challenge. So people begin to gather for this show, and Elijah lets the prophets of Baal go first. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, I love this, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Some translations say perhaps he's in the bathroom, right? Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But I love this. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Their God was mute. Nothing happened. So Elijah is like, all right, guys, you guys have had your turn. It's my turn. But before I pray to my God, I want to take the most precious thing that we have right now, water. And I want to douse this altar with water. So over and over, he had people bring water, and they dug a trench around the altar that he had built, and they poured water just all over it. And verse 35 says that the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, even the stones and the soil, and it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had, brought them down, had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, Valley and slaughtered there. Like, what a win for God. What an incredible moment. What a win for Elijah. Like, they should be throwing a parade for him. But that's not what happened next. Right after this, we read in 1 Kings 19.1, it says, Now Ahab told his wife, the queen, Jezebel, everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. I'm coming for you. I'm going to kill you. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Are you kidding me? Why was he so afraid? 
Look at, look at what God had just done. Not only did he defeat these prophets of Baal with this extraordinary act that God had done, but after that, after three years of drought, it started to rain and the ground became fertile again. And yet Elijah was afraid. And at a time he should be relishing in victory, he is running for his life. It says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Now, before we go, what's wrong with Elijah? He just lacks a bunch of faith, doesn't he? Maybe we should consider this. But Elijah is burned out. Let's go over those stages again. Emotional exhaustion, stage one. Is he emotionally exhausted? Absolutely. Look at what he's been through for the past three years. How about stage two? Increased frequency and duration of negative assessment. Yeah. He says, I am no better than my ancestors. Does he have a loss of emotional stability, personal discipline, and resiliency? Yes. He says, I've had enough, Lord. I quit. I'm done. Does he feel totally isolated? Look at 1 Kings 19.10. This is what Elijah says to God. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And he says, I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He says this to God two times. And after a while, God answers Elijah. He's like, you know, Elijah, there are 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed a knee to Baal. Elijah feels isolated, but he's not. And then stage five, he's no longer effective. That's actually God's assessment of him. This is what it says in 1 Kings 19, 9. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Like he had disconnected from his mission. And he even has identity impairment and confusion. Like you have to have identity impairment and confusion if you're asking God to take your life. So what am I saying this for? Because Elijah is messed up. He is burned out, like clinically. And some of you, like you haven't had the same type of experiences and stressors he's had, but you've had a whole lot, you've had a whole lot of different ones, and you're experiencing the same type of impact in your life. So if that's where you're at, you're dealing with high amounts of stress, or you're moving in that direction of burnout, what, what do we need to do about it? What do we learn from God's word about dealing with stress and burnout? The first thing we see with Elijah is this, that God took care of Elijah physically. If you remember early on, we talked about how mental health issues really flow out of four buckets. There's the situational, the biological, the clinical, and the spiritual bucket. And we have focused a lot of our attention on the spiritual side of things because we believe everything is spiritual. Now, not everything is exclusively spiritual, so we want to talk about these other things too, but there's not an area of your life that does not have spiritual meaning, purpose, or consequences. And so you're starting to hear me now say, hey, you need to start taking care of yourself physically, and you may not think that that's very spiritual, but it absolutely is. We see with Elijah that God fed him. Now, some of you you are stress eaters. You will eat when you're stressed. But Elijah seemed to be going in the opposite direction. In his stress, he seemed to be neglecting himself in that way. And so God provided food and water for him. And the other thing that he needed was to sleep. And God let him sleep. And again, some of you are going to think this is just absolutely shallow theology, but it's not. Sometimes getting rest is one of the best things that you can do spiritually. In fact, for many of you, this is like going to be your only takeaway for today. You're like writing this down. I'm going to challenge you. Ready for this? I'm going to challenge you to take a nap today. Some of you are like, yes! Right? Now, if you're already doing that while I'm preaching, you don't need one this afternoon. Okay? But if you, if you get a nap today, 
Hey, shoot me a message. Let me know you did it, like before 9 p.m., okay? Shoot me a text. Shoot me a message. Say, hey, mission accomplished. I took my nap. Some of you are like, this is the first time I've ever done anything with one of Steve's sermons. Like The only application. You guys are jerks. All right, but look, <laughs> when, when, God, when God takes care of Elijah physically, what this does is it actually puts Elijah in a position where he can hear from God more clearly again. Some of us, we are running ourselves ragged. And we are in a position where we can't even hear God right now because we're dealing with so much noise and we're headed in the direction of burnout. So if you're dealing with this, maybe you need to take a look at at taking care of yourself physically so you can position yourself better to hear from God. So what are some proactive things that you can do to maybe modify your behavior? I mean, they're, they're obvious, right? Eat right. Get some, get some exercise. Get some sun on your face. Probably not today, but in general, right? Get seven, eight hours of sleep each night. Don't bury your face in your phone. Look to reduce your workload. Leave your work at work so that you can be in a more healthy headspace to be able to listen to God. Secondly, we see that God reminded Elijah of the big picture. Remember, it it, it wasn't Elijah who was the one who was delivering the people. Elijah wasn't the one who made fire come down from heaven. God did that. That was all God's doing. Elijah didn't end the drought. God ended the drought. Elijah was only playing a part that God wanted him to play in this process of what God was doing. But Elijah, in his mind, had really drifted. He thought it all depended on him. And he was very specific with God in the way he cried out. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. And I, I'm the only one left. He's putting himself up, kind of puffing himself up, thinking that it all depended on him. But it didn't. It wasn't him. God had this. Elijah had just kind of drifted in his mind and he forgot that God is the one who is in control. You ever do that though? You look at the things on your to-do list and you begin to think, oh my goodness, it all rests on me. It all rests on my shoulders. And everything seems to be so urgent. And the urgent can really overpower the important. We can give our, all, all our time to the next thing and the next thing, and then we have nothing left for the really important things. And I, I got to be honest with you. I got to be really careful about this in my role as a pastor. I know so many pastors who think that it all depends on them. They've got to be the one who makes all the calls, meets every need, changes everyone's lives, fixes everyone's marriages. And there are so many urgent things that we we think need our immediate attention. And what can happen is we can really lose sight of some important things. Like I said, I've got to be careful that I'm not pouring my all into the church, that I have nothing left for my wife and my kids when I come home. Or that I'm really short with them because I'm just emotionally spent. Sometimes I need to be reminded that God's got this. I need to be reminded that my family is really my first ministry. And if my family is not spiritually healthy, if my family is, is not there, then I'm coming from a place of unhealth and I'm really no good to anyone else. And I see so many of you guys, you are jam-packing your schedule with so much. And it's probably good stuff. And it's for the kids. And so everything's just so urgent. But what happens is it causes a neglect to what's really important sometimes. And what's really important is a relationship with God. And your kids' relationship with God God reminded Elijah of the big picture. It wasn't about Elijah. God's got this. And then third, God told Elijah to find a ministry partner. So Elijah was under the false assumption that he was completely alone. He had to do it all on his own. And that isolation really took away from his resiliency. But as I said, God reminded him he wasn't alone. There were 7,000 people in Israel who had not bowed down to the pagan god Baal. And God wanted one of those 7,000 to be a more constant companion of Elijah's and his successor. And that ended up being a man named Elisha. You see, we were never meant to do life alone. And it's in isolation where Satan can get to us more easily. So Elijah was burned out. But, But he didn't stay that way. 
even though he had this incredibly dark moment or incredibly dark season in his life as, as stress compounded on him, Elijah finished well. Elijah was a prophet for many, many years, and he left an incredible successor in Elisha. And Elijah is actually w- one of only two people in the Bible who never died. Did you know that? Uh, the first was Enoch in the book of Genesis. He didn't die, but he was taken up to heaven by God. And then there was number two, Elijah. He left in a powerful way. The Bible says that a chariot of fire appeared and Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind instead of dying. So how do we handle the stress? Because we're going to face it. How do we handle the stress so it doesn't consume us and cause burnout? Like how do we finish well like Elijah? And the best thing that we can do is to catch it early. You remember that first stage, emotional exhaustion. Are you feeling a loss in vitality? Are you feeling overextended emotionally? Are you having prolonged stress? This is where you need to start taking care of some of those things we've been talking about. How am I doing physically? Am I mission drifting? Am I trying to do it by myself? Where am I in these stages of burnout? So here's what I want to encourage you with. I want to encourage you, first of all, to do a physical assessment of yourself. Do what you need to do to, play, to put yourself in a place where you can hear and respond to God better. And again, we kind of mentioned these, and it sounds so simple, maybe even shallow, but it's not. Things like eating right, exercising, getting rest, they're needed. Secondly, find places of personal emotional replenishment. A place where you can disconnect from the stress and have a moment or a few moments with God. This is talked about over and over throughout the Bible when when God commands that we honor and remember the Sabbath. This was for our good to pull back. If you read through 1 Kings 19, you find this really interesting part where Elijah experiences the presence of God in a unique way. And so what happens is, just briefly, God sends this great wind, but God's presence wasn't in this great wind. And then he sends an earthquake, but God's presence wasn't in the earthquake. And then God sends fire. And again, same thing, God's presence wasn't in the fire. So he wasn't in all these big things. But then came a gentle whisper. And this is where Elijah experienced the presence of God. We we need those places where we can have replenishment because that's where we rebuild a position of stability with God as our foundation. And then third, remember the big picture. Like too much stress can blur our vision. And as I said, we start to see the urgent and forget the important. Prioritize the important over the urgent because that's when we begin to mission drift. We get off track. Fill your mind with scripture so you're constantly reminded of the sovereignty and control that God has. Someone once put it this way, you need to find a place where God becomes bigger and you become smaller. And it's not that God was, wasn't always bigger. What it is, is it's a redirection of our priorities to recognize that it all doesn't depend on me. That it depends on God and he's big enough to handle it. And God's going to use this then for his glory. And then final one, and you probably knew this one was coming because we've said it almost every week in one way or another. It's been a common theme throughout this series. Never walk alone. We we need not only a community of believers, but we also need to make sure that we are walking in step with Jesus through communion and obedience with him. Your story can be like that of Elijah, even if you are dealing with burnout, even if you are stressed out. I want you to know your story isn't over. God's not through with you. You can finish well, but it starts with getting that relationship with God prioritized as first importance, that firm foundation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may Christ be our firm foundation so that we can withstand the chaos and the stress of life. God, forgive us when we begin to drift from that and think that it all depends on me. And in our pride, we think we're the only ones who can handle this. We got to do it all on our own. Forgive us because we know that you have provided a family of faith for us. And more importantly, you've provided yourself, that you are a God who is sovereign and in control. 
So may we trust in you. May our surrender be to you. May our allegiance be to you. May we put you as first importance above everything else. And as we do that, that you will direct our paths. God, we thank you for what Jesus has done for us by giving his life to pay the penalty for our sins. And so may we feel this lightness, those of us who are followers of Jesus, and knowing that the burden of our sin has been paid for. And may we live on mission for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so before we close and sing this last song, I just want to remind you over to our right, we're going to have some people in our fireside room. If you have a decision to make about following Jesus, surrendering your life to him, or you just need some prayer, anytime during this next song or after the service, you can make your way over there.